the common nature of epidemics and their relation to climate and civilization. Also, remarks on contagion and quarantine. From writings and official reports by Southwood Smith, medical doctor, physician to the London Fever Hospital, consulting physician to the Hospital for Diseases of the Skin, the father of sanitary reform, member of the General Board of Health, 1848 to 1854, author of The Philosophy of Health, The Divine Government, edited by T. Baker, Esquire, of the Inner Temple, Barrister at Law, author of The Laws Relating to Public Health, Sanitary, Medical, Protective, The Laws Relating to Burials, Philadelphia, J.B. Lippincott & Co., 1866. Introduction The recent very serious outbreak of epidemic disease among the cattle in England may not unreasonably induce the fear that a human epidemic is approaching. Cholera has prevailed in Paris and several other places on the continent during the late autumn, and it is well known that the former visitations of that terrible disease in this country have appeared the year following similar attacks abroad. Moreover, human epidemics in numerous instances have been preceded or accompanied by extensive moraine among cattle. Never was a country guided through the perils of an epidemic with greater wisdom and energy than Great Britain during the cholera of 1848 to 1849. The master spirit on that occasion was Dr. Southwood Smith. Long previous to that time, this great man had had a more extended experience of the nature, causes, and treatment of zymotic diseases than perhaps any physician before or since. He had made them his special study, and applied the great powers of his clear reasoning and philosophic mind to the discovery of their causes and the best means of arresting their progress. Whilst occupying the post of responsibility as the chief medical advisor of the nation in his capacity of medical member of the General Board of Health, Dr. Southwood Smith left behind a set of official reports on the subjects of epidemics, contagion, and quarantine, which will never die. The reports drawn up by Dr. Southwood Smith, writes Dean Peacock, on the proper precautions to be taken to meet the recent outbreaks of cholera have been of the most essential service wherever their recommendations have been followed. If Dr. S. Smith, however, had no other claims on the lasting gratitude of the nation, I would refer to his reports on quarantine as quite sufficient to establish them. They have contributed, more than any other publications on this subject, to dissipate the gross and mischievous delusions upon which these regulations are founded and which are known to be so injurious to the free commercial intercourse and prosperity of the nations. After Dr. Southwood Smith left office, he gave us a concise summary of his experience in two masterly lectures now published, together with extracts from his official reports. In times of distress, it is only natural to look for the most efficient help Our herds only have extensively suffered of late, but we ourselves may follow, and it is well to be prepared. Even with reference to the causes and treatment of the epizootic, the reasonings, facts, and conclusions again brought forward in the following pages will apply. But should the worst fears become realized and an extensive human epidemic follow, these writings will tell with greater force and the nation will be better prepared to meet the danger for having calmly considered beforehand the probability of its approach. One ground of hope that we may escape a visitation of cholera during the coming summer may be afforded by the remarkably tempestuous weather which prevailed in December and January last. The loss of the steamship London which foundered in the Bay of Biscay with 226 souls on the 11th January, and the still more remarkable fact that during the night of the 10th, out of 62 vessels riding at anchor in Torbay, 
41 either foundered or were dashed to pieces on the rocks. These were terrible calamities, and they were only the most striking examples of the numerous wrecks and disasters which have occurred in the course of the late, most tempestuous season, but they afford a hope of escape from a worse peril. The Common Nature of Epidemics some account of the structure and functions of the human frame, of the action of physical agents on this wonderful machinery, and of the principle which relate to individual as well to public health, ought to form a part of elemental education. There is a growing conviction that the necessity for such knowledge is not restricted to the physician, that it is essential also to the educator, the mother, the nurse, and indeed to everyone who would enjoy, together with the due development of his physical, intellectual, and moral nature, the full term of the boon of life. The main causes which shorten and embitter human life, as far as that unhappy result depends on the disturbance of health, are within our own control. There is the closest connection between the knowledge we have acquired of the physical conditions on which the life and health of individuals and communities depend and on our command over these conditions. Every fact we have learnt respecting the great laws of nature, on our conformity to which our very existence depends, has taught us that the circumstances which produce excessive sickness and early death are preventable. The character of pestilence, which gave it its great power and terror, that it walketh in darkness, is its character no longer. Its veil has fallen, and with it its strength. A clear and steady light now marks its course from its commencement to its end, and that light places an equally broad and strong relief its antagonist and conqueror, cleanliness. The term epidemic has become a popular one. It is derived from two Greek words which signify upon the people prevalent among the people, diseases which, at one and the same time, prevail extensively among large masses of the people. Recently, these diseases have received another name, which is also becoming familiar, zymotic, from a Greek word which signifies to ferment, as if the efficient cause of these diseases, whatever it may be, acts in the manner of a ferment. Epidemic diseases, though called by a common name, present great differences in their external characters. Plague, yellow fever, cholera, smallpox, typhus, scarlet fever, influenza, present characters so definite and special that they have been naturally regarded as distinct diseases, and they really are so different as to render it desirable for many reasons that each should be discriminated and denoted by its proper name. Amidst this great diversity in form, however, they present very striking resemblances of which the following are generally recognized. 1. Epidemics resemble each other in being all fevers. They all exhibit that particular assemblage of symptoms which from time immemorial it has been agreed to denote by the term fever. This is as true of the great epidemics of former times as of those which prevail in our own. The so-called Black Death of the 14th century was a fever, an aggravated form of the Oriental or Bubo Plague, in which there occurred, in addition to the ordinary symptoms of that dreadful disease, effusions of black blood forming black spots on the arms, face, and chest. From this circumstance, it derived its name. These effusions on the external surface of the body were accompanied by profuse and mortal discharges from the internal organs. The Oriental Plague, the great devastator of Europe in former times, and still the scourge of some portions of it, is a fever characterized by specific glandular inflammation. The sweating sickness of the 15th and 16th centuries was a fever, with symptoms of acute rheumatism, attended with a fetid perspiration which poured from the body in streams. 
Suddenly, says Hollingshed, a deadly burning sweat assailed their bodies and distempered their blood, and all, as soon as the sweat took them, yielded the ghost. The cholera of modern times is a fever, which appears in its true character when the first stroke of the disease does not prove fatal, and time is allowed for the full development of its successive stages. The common epidemics of the day, ordinary as distinguished from extraordinary epidemics, typhus, scarlet fever, smallpox, measles, are so universally recognized as fevers that the popular notion of fever is derived from the external characters which these maladies present. 2. Epidemics resemble each other in the extent of their range. Ordinary diseases attack single individuals, and if, from some season or other causes, several cases occur simultaneously, they are still isolated and scattered. They never prevail at the same time among several members of a family or among the inhabitants generally of a court, street, or town. Epidemics, on the contrary, derive their name from their attacking large numbers at once. The great epidemics of all ages have been strikingly characterized by their widespread course. The Black Death extended from China to Greenland and desolated in its course Asia, Europe, and Africa. The Bubo Plague of the Middle Ages often extended beyond its proper seat. In the 15th century, it spread 17 times over different European countries and extended to the most distant northern nations. The sweating sickness prevailed simultaneously or in rapid succession over England, France, Germany, Prussia, Poland, Russia, Norway, and Sweden. It extended, say the chronicles of the day, like a violent conflagration which spread in all directions, yet the flames did not issue from one focus, but rose up everywhere as if self-ignited. The influenza of the Middle Ages took a range which may be said to have been universal. In our own day, we have seen the same disease attack almost every family in nearly every city, town, and village, spread within a short period over the whole of Europe and then extended through the vast continent of the New World. Cholera traverses the earth in zones, spreads with equal facility through tropical and polar regions, and attacks alike the seats of civilization and the huts of the slave and the savage. 3. Epidemics resemble each other in the rapidity of their course. Sometimes, indeed, they begin slowly, advance haltingly, and gather strength in silence. For some time they give so little indication of their power that the apprehension of their presence is very constantly regarded as a false alarm. Now and then, here and there, they strike a sudden and mortal blow, but it is only an individual that falls. After a considerable interval, perhaps at a great distance, another blow is struck, and then one by one, another and another until at last the fact becomes too manifest to be doubted or denied that two victims have been seized in one family, several in the same street, three or four on the same day, in distant parts of the town or in the adjoining town, or it may be in towns separated from each other by the distance of hundreds of miles. At length, the terror-stricken nation, startled from its fondly cherished security, sees no place safe from the plague. When, however, the causes are intense, it may break forth quite suddenly and spread with astonishing rapidity. In 1831, when cholera first appeared in Cairo, it extended within the space of five days over the whole of Lower Egypt, desolating simultaneously all the towns and villages of the Delta. In 1832, it leaped at one bound from London to Paris and whence once there, spread in five days over thirty-five out of forty-eight quarters of the city. When influenza broke out in London in 1847, it spread in one day over every part of the metropolis, and upwards of five hundred thousand persons suffered from the malady. 
4. Epidemics resemble each other in giving distinct and unmistakable warnings of their approach. These warnings consist of two events. First, the sudden outbreak and general spread of some milder epidemic. And secondly, the transformation of ordinary diseases into diseases of a new type, more or less resembling the character of the extraordinary disease at hand. It is a very singular fact that both in the Middle Ages and in modern times, the lesser epidemic, which has generally preceded and pre-announced the coming of the greater, is influenza. The history of European epidemics from the 14th century downwards shows that whenever a new plague was at hand, destined to become truly European, it was preceded by a sudden outbreak of influenza, as general it was, as it was violent. This is exemplified with singular uniformity in the epidemics of the 16th century, the severest epidemic period on record. It is most remarkable that in our own day, the first visitation of epidemic cholera was preceded by an outbreak of influenza, which resembled in the most minute particulars, the violent and universal influenza that ushered in the mortal sweating sickness epidemic of 1517. So again, on the second visitation of cholera in 1848, it was preceded, as we have just seen, by the universal influenza of 1847. The second circumstance, and a most instructive one it is, premonitory of the advent of a great epidemic, is a general transformation of the type of ordinary diseases into the characteristic type of the approaching pestilence. Sydenham gives a graphic description of such a transformation in the character of the fevers and inflammatory diseases prevailing in London some months before the outbreaks of the Great Plague. He states that this change consisted in an approximation, in several striking features, of the general type of disease to the distinguishing characters of the pestilence which had not yet appeared but was close at hand. In 1831, in the wards of the London Fever Hospital, I observed and recorded a precisely similar change in the general type of the fevers in London, six months before the first visitation of cholera. Anterior to that period, a fever in London, for a long series of years, had been essentially an acute inflammatory disease for which bloodletting and other depleting remedies were indispensable. At this period, it ceased to be an inflammatory disease it became a disease of debility, in which no one could think of bleeding, and so closely did the prevailing fever now put on the general character of the approaching plague, which was as yet six months distant, that the fever into which those cholera patients fell, who were not killed by the first stroke, the consecutive fever, as it was afterwards called, could not be distinguished from the primary fever in the wards of the hospital when cholera was at its height, which had appeared there for the first time six months previously, and which has never disappeared since. It is further very remarkable that the professors of veterinary medicine and surgery in London noted at the same time a similar change in the type of diseases of the lower animals. Horses, cows, sheep, and all domestic creatures, a change requiring a similar modification of the remedies which they had been in the habit of using. 5. A further character of great epidemics partly arising from the last is this. They are actually present and in operation some time before they assume their distinct and proper form. Sometimes, indeed, the very first cases are most intense and characteristic, but at others they are scarcely to be distinguished from the severer attacks of ordinary disease of a like nature. Hence, doubt is sometimes reasonably entertained of their true character. When at length increasing numbers leave no doubt of the actual presence of the dreaded malady, the first announcement of it is always perceived with incredulity, and sometimes with resentment. And so it is that epidemics always take a country by surprise, burst suddenly on an unprepared people, who willfully shut their eyes against the plainest evidence as if they would avert the event by denying its existence. 6. Again, 
Epidemics resemble each other in the uniformity of their course. They present, with great regularity, periods of comparative quiescence in activity, periods of well-marked increase, culmination, and decrease. 7. They further resemble each other in the manner of their migration. They advance by leaps. On breaking out in a locality, they soon come to their height, decline, and disappear. Then they attack another locality. Here they pass through precisely the same process as before, and proceed to a third, fourth, or fifth district, and so on. Sometimes, indeed, they localize themselves on the same spot for a considerable period, and then several places may be simultaneously affected. But for the most part, a large city may be regarded as a cluster of towns, through the several districts of which epidemics advance as if they were proceeding from one town or village to another. Hence, the duration of an epidemic in a place is generally proportionate to its size, the several localities attacked being visited in succession. A space of time is required to spread through the whole of them, proportionate to the magnitude of the town. 8. Epidemics resemble each other in the periodicity of their return. On its first visitation, 1485, the sweating sickness spread over the whole of England in the course of one year when it disappeared. After an interval of 20 years, it broke out a second time quite suddenly, 1505, revisited nearly all the seats of its former ravages, and again disappeared at the end of six months. On its third visitation, 1517, after an interval of 11 years, it again finished its course within six months. Its fourth visitation, 1528, was repeated after a further interval of precisely 11 years. Such was its violence on this occasion that the historians of that day designate this period by the significant name of the Great Mortality. It drove Henry VIII from London destroyed several of the most distinguished persons of the court, impressed the nation, from the monarch to the peasant, with an awful feeling of the uncertainty of life, continued its destructive course for its accustomed period of six months, and then again disappeared. From this to its fifth and last visitation, 23 years elapsed, from 1528 to 1551. It then broke out with unmitigated fury, spread once more over the whole of England, ceased within six months, and from that period has never reappeared in any country. The Oriental Plague of the Middle Ages returned with a like periodicity, and so it does at the present day in the countries in which it maintains its ancient reign. It recurs with much regularity about every ten years. The fever epidemics of the metropolis return pretty constantly about every 10 or 12 years. The Irish typhus epidemics have recurred nearly decennially for the last 150 years. Epidemic cholera, on its first visitation, ravaged Great Britain for a period of 15 months. It then wholly ceased. After an interval of 16 years, it again broke out and pursued its former course for the same exact period of 15 months, and then ceased. Within the brief interval of only five years, it last year, 1854, accomplished its third visitation. It now protracted its stay for a period of 17 months, coming sooner and staying longer. 9. Again, epidemics resemble each other in the brevity of the space that intervenes between the attack and death. The Black Death was often fatal on the first day of the attack, generally on the third or fourth. In England, it was sometimes fatal within 12 hours and frequently in two days, particularly when spitting of blood or any other form of hemorrhage was amongst the early symptoms. The violent inflammatory fever which characterized the sweating sickness generally ran its course in a few hours. In severe cases, indeed, the crisis was always over within a day and a night, 
but it often proved fatal in six hours. In our own day, we have witnessed many instances in which epidemic cholera was fatal within 12 hours. I have known several in which the fatal event followed in 10 hours, the patient having been within an hour of the dreaded attack in apparent health. In all great epidemics, the protraction of the disease beyond three or four days is a favorable omen. One of the objects in the treatment of the sick is to gain time. If nature's first violent effort to expel the enemy that has taken possession of the system does not destroy life, the vital powers rally and the frame often survives the storm. 10. Lastly, epidemics resemble each other in being produced by the same causes. The whole tenor of experience shows that whatever produces an especial liability to one epidemic produces a similar liability to every other. The causes of epidemics, as of all other diseases, are divided into two classes, the predisposing and the primary. The predisposing cause are those circumstances which bring the body into a fit state for the action of the primary. The primary cause is the agent which directly and immediately excites the disease. If a number of persons in an ordinary state of health, say a hundred, are exposed to the primary cause of any epidemic, to the poison of cholera, for example, probably not more than ten would be seized with the disease. Why do the ninety escape? The poison, by the supposition, encompasses and acts upon all alike. Why do ten only suffer? Suppose these same hundred persons took a large dose of arsenic or an overdose of chloroform. Not only would one not escape, but every individual would certainly perish. It is conceived that the primary cause cannot take effect unless the system be in a state of susceptibility to its action, that there is in the body an innate power of resistance to all noxious agents of this kind, rendering it, when in full vigor, invulnerable to them, that there are certain circumstances which weaken or destroy this resisting power, and which even impart to the body a peculiar susceptibility to the influence of such agents. In these circumstances are called predisposing causes. The predisposing causes of epidemics may be divided into two classes, external and internal. The external are those which vitiate the atmosphere. The internal are those which more immediately vitiate the blood. The vitiators of the atmosphere include overcrowding, filth, putrescent animal, and vegetable matters of all kinds, exhalations from foul cesspools, sewers, rivers, canals, ditches, marshes, swamps, etc. Causes of this class are called localizing because they favor the generation and spread of epidemics in the localities in which they abound. The causes which more immediately act from within are those which either directly introduce pernicious matters into the interior of the body in the shape of foul water or putrescent food, or which indirectly accumulate noxious matters within the system by impairing the action of the extricatory or depuritating organs, whose office it is, is to maintain the blood in a state of purity, by removing out the system substances which have served their purpose and have become useless and pernicious. The earnest attention which has been recently directed to the first class of causes has led to an advancement in the science of prevention, the importance of which it is impossible to overestimate. To give only one illustration of the action of a predisposing cause, I select as my example overcrowding. The Statistical Society of London, some time ago, appointed a committee of its council to make a house-to-house -house examination of the parish of Marlebone, with a view to ascertain how many families in the parish occupied a single room as a living and sleeping room. In the course of this inquiry, 
one of the examiners came to a house in which there was one remarkable room. It was occupied not by one family only, but by five. A separate family ate, drank, and slept in each of the four corners of this room. A fifth occupied the center. But how can you exist, said the visitor, to a poor woman whom he found in the room, the other inmates being absent on their several avocations? How can you possibly exist? Oh, indeed, your honor, she replied. We did very well until a gentleman in the middle took in a lodger. I see every day in the wards of the fever hospital the consequence of taking in such lodgers. An epidemic shows it not more truly, but more strikingly. Within the walls of an establishment for pauper children at Tooting in 1849, there were crowded 1,395 children. Little more than 100 cubic feet of breathing space was allowed for each child. 500 being the smallest compatible with safety. One night, cholera attacked 64 of these children. 300 were attacked in all. Within a week, 180 perished. In the workhouse of Taunton, there were 276 inmates. In some of the rooms, the breathing space was not more than 68 cubic feet. Cholera swept away 60 of these inhabitants in less than a week. In the county jail of the same town, the breathing space allowed to each prisoner ranges from 819 to 935 cubic feet. Not a single case of cholera, not even of, even of diarrhea, occurred among the prisoners in this jail. The townspeople also escaped, while in the overcrowded workhouses, 22% of the total number of the inhabitants were swept away. In the village of East Farley, near Maidstone, 1,000 persons were assembled for hop picking. They were lodged in sheds and had about 80 cubic feet for breathing space. In a few days, diarrhea became universal among them. 97 were attacked with cholera and 46 died. In the same village, at the same time, under another employer, who had provided proper accommodation for his laborers, there was a complete immunity from the epidemic. I could add cases of the like kind without number. I could show that animals are affected by this cause of disease no less than men, that horses overcrowded in stables die of glanders, dogs in overcrowded kennels die of distemper, sheep overcrowded in ships, even during a short passage from one country to another, die in great numbers of febrile diseases, results which prove the operation of a general law of nature. I could adduce equally decisive examples of the action of each of the principal external predisposing causes just enumerated. It has been often said that we cannot tell the difference between the air of the mountainside and that of the crowded hospitals and fever nests of towns. If it were so, it would be sufficient to say, life is more delicate than chemistry. But it is not so. The impurities in these pernicious places can be detected by chemical analysis and examined as readily as the constituents of the atmosphere itself. The moisture in the air of a crowded room may be condensed by ice. It condenses indeed spontaneously on the walls and windows and on all surfaces and may be collected in sufficient quantity for examination and experiment. If a portion of this deposit be put on a piece of platinum and burnt, a strong odor of organic substance is given off, and a quantity of charcoal remains. If the deposit be allowed to stand for a few days, it forms a solid, thick, glutinous mass, having a strong odor of animal matter. If examined by a microscope, it is seen to undergo a remarkable change. First of all, it is converted into a vegetable growth, and this is followed by the production of multitudes of animalcules, a decisive proof that it must contain organic matter, otherwise it could not nourish organic beings. At every expiration, the lungs pour a portion of organic matter into the surrounding atmosphere. At every moment, the skin does the same. This matter is the dead portion of the body, 
which it is one of the special offices of these depurating organs to remove out of the living system as useless and pernicious. It is indeed pernicious, for it is an animal poison, more concentrated in this than in any other form of excrementious matter, since in other excretions the noxious particles, in their transmission out of the body, are diluted with other substances, but as they issue from the lungs and skin, they are in a great degree undiluted. Ventilation and cleanliness prevent this matter from accumulating and render it innoxious, but it collects in large quantities on the furniture and walls of dirty houses and is the main cause of the disagreeable smell of the rooms in which it abounds. In some instances, the walls are coated with it. It was so in one particular building in which, during a local epidemic outbreak, twelve persons were attacked with cholera and four died. From recent chemical and microscopical examinations of the air of some crowded and filthy localities in the metropolis, it appears, as a general result, that decomposing organic matter is always contained in such air, the never-failing presence of animalcules testifying its existence, and their number and size indicating its amount. Imagine the state of the atmosphere in the dormitories of the Tooting children in the 68 cubic feet of breathing space of the inmates of the Taunton workhouse, in the 80 cubic feet of the Kentish hop pickers, in the four corners and center of the family room. Conceive the state of the atmosphere in this room at night, all the members of the several families collected, every breath of external air excluded, the windows and perhaps even the chimney carefully fastened up, this stagnant and poisoned air breathe over and over again by every individual for seven or eight hours continuously. Respiration, the special and admirable apparatus which nature has constructed for purifying the blood, thus made the very means of corrupting it. I have known from two to three cases of typhus produced nightly for a fortnight together in a room of this description by sleeping in it for a single night. Can we wonder at the generation of typhus in such a room in ordinary seasons? Can we wonder at the spread and the havoc of an epidemic in it in epidemic seasons? But besides the contamination of the air by external causes, it is conceived that the atmosphere itself undergoes natural changes which predispose it to the development and spread of epidemics. From time immemorial, the popular belief has been that such changes do take place and that they manifest themselves by unmistakable signs. Among such signs may be reckoned a disturbance of the regular and ordinary condition of the atmosphere, an inversion of the seasons, summer and winter and winter and summer, long continued drought succeeded by torrents of rain, causing rivers to overflow and the sea to rot in the earth. Cloud, mist, fog, favoring excessive dampness, under the influence of which spring up inordinate growths of the lower species of plants, producing moldiness and the blood spots, and other colored vegetation that adhere to houses and household furniture, and wearing apparel and personal ornaments and the person itself, under which also, fostered by a steadily elevated temperature, spring into being and activity myriads of the lower tribes of animals, locusts, caterpillars, flies, frogs, covering the face of the earth and devouring every green thing that the deluge of rain had left, and as the consequence of these antecedent conditions, dearth and famine, closing the long series of the year's calamities. Such in all ages and countries have been the recognized portents and precursors of a coming year of pestilence. And there is truth in this. It is quite certain that such atmospheric changes do place, take place and prepare the way for pestilence. It is quite certain that there is an epidemic meteorology. This epidemic condition of the atmosphere is at length coming within the range of science. The first step towards this result, which promises to be of the highest practical value, 
we owe to the well-devised and patient observations of Mr. Glacier continued through the three recent cholera epidemics. Among other important facts, he has determined that there is, one, an increased pressure of the atmosphere, greatest at the worst period of the epidemic, two, an increased density of the atmosphere, not arising from an increase of watery vapor, four, three, the quantity of water in the air was one twentieth less than the average at the same time that the mean weight of a cubic foot of air was two grains above the average. 4. An unusual alternation of heat and cold, yet the heat predominating to such an extent that in particular localities it rose as much as from 2 degrees to 8 degrees above the average. These excesses were most striking at night, particularly in the parts of London on a level with the Thames where the night temperatures ranged from 7 degrees, 8 degrees, 9 degrees, and 10 degrees above the temperature of the country and even of the suburban districts. These temperatures were highest, especially the night ones, when the mortality was greatest, and the mortality was greatest where the temperatures were highest. 5. A remarkable increase above the average in the temperature of the water of the Thames. For a long series of observations, it has been found that the normal temperature of the Thames is 51.7 degrees. During the prevalence of the epidemic, it rose to 60 degrees, 66 degrees, and once to 70 degrees. At this temperature, the simmering water must have poured enormous quantities of vapor into the surrounding atmosphere. Not the pure vapor of water, for that cannot arise from a river which is the recipient of the foul contents of all the sewers and cesspools of the metropolis. In some instances, there was an excess of 20 degrees of the temperature of the water above that of the air. For 28 continuous nights during the height of the epidemic, the average excess exceeded 16.5 degrees. 6. An unusual prevalence of haze, mist, and fog. The fog being sometimes so dense that London could not be discerned from Greenwich. 7. An extraordinary stillness and stagnation of the air, both by day and night. Sometimes in the low-lying districts not a breath could be observed. Even when at more elevated stations, the wind was moving with the force of one pound seven ounce. The pressure was only one quarter pound in the heart of London. Wind is the ventilator of nature. Artificial ventilation, as far as it is successful, is an imitation of nature's process. It is stated on undoubted authority, Maitland's History of London, that for several weeks before the Great Plague broke out in London, there was an uninterrupted calm, so that there was not sufficient motion of the air to stir a vein. Baynard, a contemporary physician, confirms this fact. The like circumstance is mentioned by T. Emmerbreck in giving an account of the plague at Nimogenin. At the period when the last plague visited Vienna, according to Sir Gilbert Blaine, there had been no wind for three months. The terrific outbreak of the cholera at Karachi was preceded for some days by such a stagnation of the atmosphere that an oppression scarcely to be endured affected the whole population. It is obvious that calms must favor the accumulation and concentration of effluvia from every source from which they arise. 8. A general deficiency in the tension of common, positive electricity. 9. A deficiency of one-fourth of the rainfall for the year. During 118 consecutive days, there was scarcely any rain and not a single drop for 18 days at the period of the highest mortality. 10. A total absence of ozone at all the stations near the river, while at stations of high elevation it was of general occurrence. These observations relate particularly to the epidemic of 1854, which was most carefully watched than the two former, but the results are similar for each.
The three epidemics, says Mr. Glashier, in summing up the results of his inquiry, were attended with a particular state of atmosphere, characterized by a prevalent mist, thin in high places, dense and low. During the height of the epidemic, in all cases, the reading of the barometer was remarkably high, the atmosphere thick, and in 1849 and 1854 the temperature above its average. A total absence of rain and a stillness of air amounting almost to calm accompanied the progress of the disease on each occasion. In places near the river, the night temperatures were high, with small diurnal range and with a dense torpid mist and air charged with the many impurities arising from the exhalations of the Thames and adjoining marshes. A deficiency of electricity, and as shown in 1854, a total absence of ozone, most probably destroyed by the decomposition of the organic matter with which the air in these situations is so strongly charged. In both 1849 and 1854, the first decline of the disease was marked by a decrease in the readings of the barometer and in the temperature of the air and water. The air, which previously had for a long time continued calm, was succeeded by a strong southwest wind which soon dissipated the former stagnant and poisonous atmosphere. We knew before that such influences were in operation, but they had not been weighed and measured. We know now definitely something of an epidemic atmosphere, and the information obtained is most significant, for it shows that the several meteorological changes that take place during the prevalence of an epidemic concur to produce a heavy, warm, moist, and stagnant atmosphere which disturbed electricity, conditions fav highly favorable to the decomposition of organic matter. Under the influence of such an atmosphere, over the moist and warm surface of every filthy place, over the entire mass of all accumulations of filth in streets, lanes, and courts, and within and about houses, and over the heated surface of all foul water, decomposition goes on with the utmost activity and the products are poured into the stagnant air. Against such products, the human body has no defense. The lungs admit whatever is brought to them, poisonous and salubrious substances alike. They are guarded by none of those protective contrivances which we see in some other parts of the body. Whatever is capable of suspension in the respired air passes with it directly into the current of the circulation, and when once there, is carried with astonishing rapidity into the very substance of the vital organs. From the quantity of air which the lungs receive, some conception may be formed of the amount of obnoxious matter which may be introduced into the system through these portals. At each inspiration, there enter the lungs of an ordinary sized person about 20 cubic inches of air. There are 20 respirations in a minute. 400 cubic inches of air must therefore enter in one minute, 14 cubic feet in one hour, and 366 cubic feet, or 36 hogsheads, in one day. To meet this, the heart sends into the lungs at each contraction two ounces of blood. There are 75 pulsations in a minute, during which 150 ounces are propelled into the lungs, a quantity which gives 562 pounds in one hour and 24 hogsheads in 24 hours. The main purpose for bringing these enormous quantities of air and blood together with such velocity is to provide for the enormous waste which is caused by the rapid and unceasing mutation of organic matter. The activity of an organ is sustained at the expense of the matter of which it is composed. No thought passes through the mind, but an equivalent portion of the substance of the brain is consumed. No nervous current flows along the nervous conductors, but a corresponding portion of nervous tissue is used up. No muscular movement, no glandular secretion, takes place without a proportionate waste of muscle and of gland. What must be the amount of supply required to meet this waste when able-bodied men employed in their ordinary labor lose from two pounds to five pounds and upwards of their weight twice a day? Some physiologists of eminence have estimated that in order to supply that waste, there passes in the course of every 24 hours as much fluid through the thoracic duct 
as equals the whole quantity of blood in the body. The results of the highly interesting experiments recently made by Professor Graham on the part taken by the active agent in all of these processes, organic membrane of which the organic cell is the type, demonstrates that all the phenomena known as endosmos and exosmos depend on a chemical action involving the destruction of organic membrane. In this process, chemical action is set up dependent upon active chemical agents, neutral substances being inoperative. Out of this chemical action, a new force is induced, the osmotic force, a purely chemical being converted into an equivalent mechanical force, which is made subservient to the essential phenomena of organic and animal life, a V motri, a force which is the extravascular movements of the body, what the contraction of the heart is to the vascular. In a frame so constructed, any particles contaminating the circulating fluid most rapidly pervade and contaminate every part of the system. It has been sometimes imagined that the quantity of matter suspended in the atmosphere and conveyed into the system in respired air must be too minute to exert any serious influence upon the body. One single puncture of the finger, so small as not to be visible without the aid of the lens, has introduced into the system a sufficient quantity of putrid matter to cause death with the most violent symptoms. A few drops of the liquid matter obtained by a condensation of the air of a foul locality introduced into the vein of a dog is stated to have produced death with the usual phenomena of typhus fever. It is certain that on the introduction into the body of an inappreciable portion of the matter of cowpox or of smallpox, those specific forms of fever are produced. From these and similar facts, it is inferred that when putrescent or decomposing organic matter is introduced into the blood, it acts as a poison and produces a phenomena of fever, and that all the predisposing causes of epidemics act in this way by overcharging the blood with the products of decomposing organic matter. Strictly speaking, however, all that we really know is this, that where certain conditions exist, epidemics break out and spread, that where those conditions do not exist, epidemics do not break out and spread, and that where those conditions did exist but have been removed, thereupon epidemics cease. We call those conditions causes, predisposing or localizing causes, but how they act, whether by accumulating decomposing organic matter in the blood, or in what other way, we have no certain knowledge. One further fact, however, is ascertained that where any of these predisposing causes is present, epidemics break out and spread just as rapidly as when all present together. Where there is overcrowding alone, for example, epidemics break out and spread. Where there is decomposing filth alone, epidemics break out and spread, and so of the whole number. The removal of one of these causes, therefore, or the removal of two or three of them, will not suffice for safety. Every one must be removed before there can be safety. This we know. All beyond this is conjecture. But as to the most probable of these conjectures, some who have thought on this subject believe that the preponderance of evidence justifies the conclusion that the predisposing causes may themselves become efficient causes, that instances in which they actually do so are constantly passing before our eyes, that it is practicable to manufacture fever and even epidemic fever to any amount by placing a population under certain known conditions, that it is practicable to prevent the outbreak of epidemics altogether by placing the population under certain other conditions, that the prevalence of the predisposing causes in particular localities in certain intensities is sufficient to produce local epidemic outbreaks, that the prevalence of such causes in such intensities joined to such general conditions of the atmosphere, such as the meteorological conditions which have been enumerated, particularly those which favor the accumulation and concentration of the products of organic decomposition, 
are all that is required to engender widespread epidemics. Those who adopt this view contend that the existence of a primary cause as a distinct and separate entity is not necessary to account for the phenomena. The more common opinion, however, is that joined to the predisposing causes, there must always be present a primary cause, having a distinct existence, capable of traveling from one part of the globe to another, capable of spreading over any space, however extended, or of confining itself to any space, however small, a discrete, a district, a street, a house, a room. It is urged that though we are unacquainted with the physical form or chemical properties of this body, this is no reason why we should not understand its force as a special agent in the production of disease, just as we know the forces of other physical bodies, though not their nature. The existence of such a body being assumed, it is conceived that it exists not in a gaseous but in liquid state. It is supposed that it cannot exist in a gaseous state because a gas is readily diffused and dissipated, because when organic matter is reduced to a gaseous state, it is passed from the organic into the inorganic kingdom, and there is no evidence that the elementary bodies belonging to this kingdom are capable of producing any form of fever, and because there is indubitable evidence that organic matter, in a recent state of protrescence, the more recent the more potent, is capable of producing the most deadly forms of fever, from these considerations, it is conjectured that the primary cause, whatever it be, is some subtle fluid which has not wholly lost its organic composition, and that it consists of particles of extreme minuteness, capable of attaching itself to the surfaces of other bodies, and even of increasing under favorable circumstances. It is therefore thought that this body is not equally diffused through the atmosphere but is only partially distributed, and that this accounts for the local distribution of epidemics, and for their occasional absence from places which apparently present all the conditions favorable to their development. Lastly, the opinion is gaining ground that this body acts in the manner of a ferment. It is urged in favor of this view that a ferment being an azotized substance in a state of putrefactive alteration the body in question must find in the decomposing organic compounds with which impure blood is charged precisely the materials for taking on the fermenting process. The advocates for this view think that the term zymotic is not only the appropriate name of the whole class of diseases, but that it also declares an interesting fact connected with them. Whatever may be the truth with respect to these points on which at present we have no positive knowledge, one thing is certain, that practically our concern is with the known causes, the ascertained conditions. These are palpable, definite, and capable of complete removal and prevention. Overcrowding, for example, we can prevent. The accumulation of filth in towns and houses we can prevent. The supply of light, air, and water together with the several other appliances included in the all-comprehensive word cleanliness, we can secure. To the extent to which it is in our power to do this, it is in our power to prevent epidemics. The human family have now lived together in communities more than 6,000 years, yet they have not learned to make their habitations clean. At last we are beginning to learn the lesson. When we shall have mastered it, we shall have conquered epidemics. Our duties then, and our hopes in this respect, I shall proceed to show. The principal constituents of the atmosphere maintain their equilibrium steadily over the whole surface of the globe. There is scarcely any difference in the relative proportion of its oxygen and nitrogen in the torrid zone and in the Arctic regions. Whatever influence the atmosphere may have on climate must consequently depend on something adventitious to it and not in anything forming a part of it. Possibly, therefore, that something may be, in some degree, under human control. 
The main constituents of climate are temperature and moisture, and these are the climatic conditions that exercise the greatest influence on epidemics. Minor but still important conditions are the nature of the soil, the proportion of land that is cleared and under cultivation, the extent of forests, lakes, and rivers, the prevailing winds, the electrical state of the atmosphere, and so on. The temperature is highest where the sun rays are vertical, or nearly so, where the sky is cloudless, where the day is longest, and where there is the smallest difference between the fervid noontide heat and the temperature of the short night. The moisture is greatest where in addition to all other sources of humidity, there are periodical rains. In the country subject to these rains, the entire extent of the level and lowland is often covered a foot deeper with water than before the rain set in. Elevated temperature and excessive moisture are combined in tropical countries, and they are concentrated in those parts of the tropics in which there are extensive forests having an undergrowth of luxuriant vegetation in which the tides of the ocean penetrate deeply into the interior of the land and mix with the waters of the rivers, and in which the rivers constantly overflow their banks and form marshes and swamps. In tropical countries, there are tracts such as these that extend an unbroken continuity, hundreds of leagues. The western coast of Africa, the Bight of Benin, presents an unbroken area of upwards of 100,000 square miles, consisting of one vast alluvial and densely wooded forest irrigated by Atlantic tides and intersected by numerous rivers and creeks, whose muddy banks are constantly overflowed. In describing a tropical forest, Humboldt says, under the bushy, deep, green verdure of trees of stupendous height and size, there reigns constantly a kind of half-daylight, a sort of obscurity of which our forests of pines, oaks, and beech trees afford no example, forming a carpet of verdure, the dark tint of which augments the splendor of the aerial light. With this luxuriance of vegetation is combined a corresponding abundance of animal life. The earth and air teem with living creatures. The mold observes the same distinguished traveler, contains the spoils of innumerable qualities of reptiles, worms, and insects. Wherever the soil is turned up, we are struck with a mass of organic substances, which by turns are developed, transformed, and decomposed. Nature in these climates appear more active, more fruitful, we might say, more prodigal of life. The air is still more alive than the land. Insects fill the lower strata of the atmosphere to the height of 15 or 20 feet, like a condensed vapor. It is estimated that a cubic foot of air is often peopled by a million of winged insects, which contain a caustic and venomous liquid, several species being nearly two lines, 1.8 long. When two persons who have their home in these regions meet in the morning, the first questions they address to each other are, how did you find the San Kudos during the night? How are we today for the mosquitoes? An ancient form of Chinese politeness, showing the ancient state of that country, was, have you been incommoded in the night by serpents? It appears that there are still inhabited places in which the Chinese compliment on the serpents might be added to that of the mosquitoes. Proportionate to this prodigality of organic life is the amount of organic decomposition, the products of which are poured into the atmosphere and suspended in the surrounding vapor and fog, to which they give a decided and often highly offensive odor. On fixing our eyes on the tops of the trees, describes Humboldt, we discovered streams of vapor wherever a solar ray penetrated and traversed the dense atmosphere exhaling, together with the aromatic odor yielded by the flowers, the fruit, and even the wood, that peculiar odor which we perceive in autumn in foggy seasons. 
It might be said that notwithstanding the elevated temperature, the air cannot dissolve the quantity of water exhaled from the surface of the soil and of the vegetation. At the distance of several miles from the coast, says Dr. Daniel in describing the western shores of Africa, the peculiar odor arising from swampy exhalations and the decomposition of vegetable matter is very perceptible and sometimes even offensive. The water also is frequently of a dusky hue, with leaves, branches, and other vegetable debris floating on the surface brought down from the by innumerable narrow channels that empty their turbid streams into the open ocean. It is under these climatic conditions that the worst forms of epidemics are engendered, the most sudden in their attack, the most rapid in their development, the most general in their prevalence, and the most mortal. The form of the epidemic prevalent in any particular district is dependent on the physical characters of the immediate neighborhood. Thus, intermittents prevail chiefly in marshy and swampy districts, remittents also chiefly there, though not exclusively, while in other localities, other forms arise approximating to the continued type of temperate climates. For the most part, these epidemics are strictly endemic and are confined to the particular regions in which they are engendered. They never pass the limit of the equatorial or tropical zone. Yellow fever, one of the most common and destructive of these diseases, is still more restricted in its range, being confined within a definite line determined by temperature. It is incapable of existing where the average range of the thermometer is greater than from 76 degrees to 86 degrees of Fahrenheit, or where the temperature varies more than from 5 degrees to 10 degrees night and day. Extreme heat and moderate cold immediately stop it, nay, even the prevalence of a cold wind for a few hours only. In other instances, these epidemics pass beyond the regions in which they are produced and sometimes extend to all the other quarters of the globe. The Black Death, the range of which we have seen, was engendered in China. The cholera of our own day, generated in the delta of the Ganges. The great source and center of Indian epidemics ravaged that country long before it directed its course to Europe. When these tropical epidemics advance into more temperate climates, they lay aside nothing of their nature. They lose but little of their power. Wherever they go, they decimate the populations which they attack. One remarkable peculiarity of some of these epidemics is that natives of the region in which they prevail are for the most part unsusceptible to them. This is true, however, only of particular forms of pestilence. Some of them acknowledge no acclimation. Cholera, for example, attacks equally natives and newcomers. On the other hand, yellow fever rarely attracts the natives who reside permanently within its zone. Its chief victims are strangers who have recently arrived within its sphere, particularly the inhabitants of northern climates. The susceptibility to its influence appears to be strictly proportionate to the degree of northern latitude from which the stranger has arrived, and the shortness of the interval that has passed since he left the European for the equatorial regions. We see something of the same kind in the widespread epidemics of our own country. During the prevalence of cholera, it was observed over and over again that persons coming directly from the pure air of the country into the infected part of a town were seized with the disease. The explanation is not obvious. It would seem, however, to be connected with the suddenness of the shock on the system. Priestley found that after shutting up a mouse in a given quantity of air, a considerable time, it seemed to be weak and to slowly be dying. If at this period he put a fresh mouse into the same air, it instantly died. It seems as if the system can bear a pestiferous atmosphere better when gradually than when suddenly exposed to it. I do not know that I can give a more vivid picture of a tropical epidemic than that which is afforded by the outbreak of cholera in the 86th Regiment 
at Kiriki in June 1846. On this occasion, the atmosphere was very peculiar. Damp, hot, stagnant, and oppressive. Not a breath of air was stirring. A few isolated cases of cholera had occurred for some days. The utmost alarm was excited in the minds of experienced persons who felt certain that an epidemic was at hand. Their fears were too fully realized. On the night of the 15th, upwards of 40 men were seized with cholera in its severest form. In two days, more 256 were attacked, of whom 131 were already dead. The floors of the hospital, says Dr. Tom, the surgeon of the regiment, were literally strewed with the livid bodies of men laboring under the pangs of premature dissolution. Many were brought in with the cold and clammy damp of death, as if sudden obstruction of every vital function had taken place, and the fountains of life had been arrested by an invisible but instantaneous shock. It was a, indeed a sight never to be forgotten, to behold the powerful frames of the finest men of a fine corpse, who had that morning been in apparent good health, and most of them on the evening parade, as if at once stricken down and striving with the last efforts of gigantic strength to resist a death call that would not be refused. In describing a river on the west coast of Africa, Dr. Daniel says, When I visited it, I found two vessels moored a short distance from its mouth, one of which, within the space of five months, had buried two entire crews, a solitary person alone surviving. The other, which had arrived in a much later period, had been similarly deprived of one half of its men, and the remainder were in such a debilitated condition as to be incapable of undertaking any active or laborious duty. Immediately before, another vessel had sailed from this port in such a deplorable state as to be solely dependent on the aid of crewmen to perform the voyage. In the statistical report of Sir Alexander Tullock, it is stated that out of 1,658 white troops, sent out to military, military stations on the western coast of Africa, 1,271 perished from climatic diseases, while of the 387 who remained to be sent home, 17 died on their passage, 157 were reported as incapable of further service, and 180 as qualified only for garrison service, thus leaving only 33 out of 1,658 men who were fit for active service. As we pass out of the torrid zone, a remarkable change takes place in the general character of epidemics. They lose more and more of their intermittent type and become more remittent or continued. The remittent keeps its hold over the southern part of Europe and continually breaks out in the form of yellow fever. As we proceed northward out of the yellow fever zone, that disease wholly disappears, and typhus and its kindred maladies take its place typhus commencing precisely at the point where yellow fever ends. There is indeed one of the ordinary diseases of temperate climes, and only one which appears capable of penetrating within the toward zone, and of committing greater ravages there than in lower temperatures, and that is smallpox. With this exception, the ordinary epidemics of temperature climates do not enter the tropics, while on the other hand, the ordinary epidemics of the tropics every now and then decimate the temperature regions. In these our latitudes, says Dr. William Ferguson, cold and fatigue and sorrow and hunger will generate fever anywhere, but every region, every climate, will exhibit its own form of fever. With us it is typhus, in the warmer countries of Europe, remittent, in the upper Mediterranean, plague, in the Antilles and Western Africa, yellow fever, this last being restricted to particular localities, temperatures, and elevation. While typhus fever goes out, when you enter the tropics, it is there that yellow fever commences, the pure epidemic of a hot climate that cannot be transported or communicated upon any other ground. Places, not persons, constitute the role of its existence. Places, not persons, comprehend the whole history, the etiology of the disease. Places, not persons. 
Let the emphatic words be dinned into the ears of the lords of the treasury, of trade and plantations, until they acquire the force of a creed, which will save them hereafter from the absurdity of enforcing a quarantine in England against a mount of solar heat of which its climate is insusceptible. Let them further be repeated in the schools of medicine until the professors become ashamed of imbuing the minds of the young with prejudice and false belief, which, should they ever visit warmer climates, may cause them to be eminently mischievous in vexing the commerce and deeply and injuriously agitating the public mind of whatever community may have received them. Climate differs not only in the different countries, but in different parts of the same country. The climate of the country is different from that of the city. The climate of every city, town, and village differs from that of every other. The temperature, the moisture, and the other meteorological conditions of different districts, nay, even of different streets in the same town, vary to such a degree as to influence materially the relative salubrity and the prevalence or absence of particular classes of diseases. These local climatic conditions and their connection with prevalent diseases have not as yet received due attention. When they shall have received it, and they will receive it, a new light will be shed on local epidemics. I pass now to civilization. We have no sufficient knowledge of the state of the people and of their diseases in any of the civilized nations of antiquity to trace the relation between them. The authentic history of periods comparatively near to our own time as far as concerns the diseases of the people goes scarcely further back than the 14th century. The first great epidemic to which I have so often called attention occurred in that century, and we have reliable evidence both of the phenomena attending this plague and the condition of the people at that time. I assume this period, therefore, as my starting point. I take of the civilized community to be one in which there exist, one, a sovereign authority, two, laws incorruptibly administered, three, physical comfort generally diffused, four, intellectual development and activity generally diffused. 5. Recognition of the fundamental principles of religion and morality. Without the two first, there can be no security for life and property, both of which must be placed in absolute and unquestionable safety before a single step can be taken out of the lowest depth of barbarism. Without the two last, none of the others can be acquired, these conditions are therefore the basis of the pyramid of society. Taking these then as the essential constituents of civilization and applying them as a test to Great Britain, we shall see that at the commencement of the 14th century England was in a state of barbarism. Since every one of these elements was wanting, although the foundation of political and social institutions containing the germs of liberty and progress had already been laid, Practically, however, at that period, there was no sovereign authority, for the king had no sufficient power to maintain order, to protect the rights and liberties of the people, or to defend his own throne against armed men, nominally his subjects, while the lord of every feudal castle exercised a more perfect sovereignty over his vassals than the so-called monarch over the nation. Every town was a fortress, in every house in which it was safe to dwell a castle, the inmates of which, like people in a garrison, constantly held themselves prepared to resist attack, from which they were never secure. They slept with arms at their side. Marauders, openly encamped on the public roads for the plunder of the wayfarer, which often ended in his murder, few persons ventured to travel alone, and none without the responsible apprehension that they might never return alive. Scarcely a third part of the area of the kingdom was under cultivation. The remainder consisted of moor, forest, and fen. Vast tracts were under water during the greater part of the year, and at other times 
formed morasses, marshes, and swamps. Immediately beyond the walls that encompassed the towns were large stagnant ditches, which being the nearest receptacles for refuse, were full of all sorts of decomposing filth. The streets were narrow, unpaved, undrained, uncleansed, and unlighted. There was no provision for the removal of the town refuse. Gutters were formed at the sides of the streets, as in Bethnal Green, and the neglected parts of all of our towns at present time, into which the inhabitants threw the refuse of their houses. Forming in dry weather a semi-fluid mass of corrupting animal and vegetable matter, and in rainy weather, black turbid rivulets which ultimately poured their contents into some water course. The houses were mean and squalid, built of wood and wattles, thatched with straw, without chimneys, the windows without glass, the floors without boards, the furniture of the rudest description. The use of linen was scarcely known, common straw formed the king's bed. The floors, says Erasmus, writing two centuries later, generally are made of nothing but loam, and are strewed with rushes, which being constantly put on fresh, without a removal of the old, remain lying there, in some cases for twenty years, with fish bones, broken victuals, the dregs of tankards, and impregnated with other filth underneath from dogs and men. Contemporary writers concur in representing the offensive odor of decaying straw and rushes as universal in the houses. There was no knowledge of the art of collecting, preserving, and storing fodder. The animals for winter food were slaughtered in autumn and their flesh salted or smoked. It was only during three months of the year, from midsummer to Michaelmas, that any fresh animal food, excepting game and river fish, was tasted even by the nobles of the land. The common people subsisted chiefly on salted beef, veal, and pork, the price of which was one half less than that of a wheat in the time of Henry the Eighth. There were no fresh vegetables. As late as the 18th century, salads were sent from Holland for the table of Queen Caroline. Sir John Pringle, writing in the middle of the last century, states that his father's gardener told him that in the time of his grandfather, cabbages were sold for a crown apiece. It was not until towards the close of the 16th century, 1585, that the potato was first brought to England where it was limited to the garden for at least a century and a half after it had been planted by Sir Walter Raleigh in his own garden. It was first cultivated as a field crop in Scotland so recently as the year 1752. For many centuries, England remained in the condition of country in which no more subsistence is produced than is barely sufficient for the necessities of the people. Consequently, every year of scarcity became a year of famine, and such years, about one in ten, occurred for ages with great irregularity, and often equaled, in their terrible results, the worst famines of antiquity. In a cold climate, fuel is nearly as important as food, for which, indeed, it is a substitute. A large portion of our daily food is used up in supporting that internal fire by which the heat of the human body in every climate and under every variety of external temperature is maintained at the 98th degree of Fahrenheit. The greater the loss of heat by cooling, the greater the amount of heat which the body itself must generate to maintain its temperature at this elevated point. This demand for additional heat cannot be supplied without additional quantities of food, and unless these supplies are afforded, the substance of the body itself, its very tissues and organs, are consumed, a process which cannot be continued long without exhaustion, disease, and death. The phrase starved by cold expresses a more literal fact than is commonly understood. Unhappily, the circumstances which deprive a population of the means of counteracting cold limit, also the supplies of food at their command, and the pressure of the twofold privation, want of food and want of fuel, commonly occurs at the very season when both these indispensable supports of life are most needed. Some conception may be formed of the suffering to which our ancestors were exposed from this cause. 
from the fact that their prejudice against the use of coal as an article of fuel was such that a law was passed rendering a capital fence to burn it within the city. And there is a record in the tower importing that a person was tried, convicted, and executed for this offense in the reign of Edward I. It was not until the reign of Charles I that there was a regular supply of coals to London. The habits of the people increased the force of these privations. Intemperance was a national vice. Excessive carousing at home or days and nights spent in taverns was the usual practice among all classes, and the physical and moral evils resulting from the custom were neither redeemed nor lessened by the epithet which these habitual convivalities appear to have conferred upon the nation of Merry England. Caius, indeed, one of the most celebrated physicians of the 16th century, couples Germany and the Netherlands with England in this common reproach. These three nations, he says, destroy more meats and drinks without all order, convenient time, reason, and necessity than all other countries under the sun, to the great annoyance of their bodies and wits. This condition of the country and this mode of life themselves constitute the most powerful causes of epidemics, and an extraordinary concurrence and concentration of these causes are manifested in the combination of the circumstances which have been enumerated, namely, in the malarious state of the greater part of the kingdom, in the confined space of the towns, in the deficiency and putrescency of the food, in the inadequacy of the means of protection from cold, and in the intemperance of the people. These were the true sources of the malignity and mortality of the pestilences of that age. We have no reliable evidence of the actual mortality produced by these terrible diseases, for no physician has left such an account of the epidemics of which he was an eyewitness as enabled us to determine it. We can therefore only take the statements of this time as we find them. According to the accounts of contemporary writers, the Black Death swept away, within the space of four years, a fourth part of the population of Europe. Some towns in England are stated to have lost two-thirds of their inhabitants, and it is computed that one-half of the entire population of the country perished. Of the sweating sickness, Bacon says it destroyed infinite persons, Stowe, a wonderful number, and other writers reckon the deaths in the places attacked by thousands. Similar representations are given of the ravages of the plague, of the pedicile, fever, and even occasionally of intermittent fever, and the substantial correctness of those statements is confirmed by entries in parish registrars still extant, which tell the story of the local outbreaks of those days with graphic and touching simplicity. During some of the worst of these visitations, contemporary writers concur in stating that the living were insufficient to bury the dead. Business was suspended. The courts of law were closed. The churches were deserted for want of a sufficient number of clergy to perform the service. And ships were seen driving about on the ocean and drifting on shore, whose crews had perished to the last man. We can form no adequate conception of the terror inspired by these events. We have seen alarm in our own day, but then it bordered on maniacal despair. It seemed as if the last judgment had come upon the world, and men abandoned alike their possessions and their friends. The rich gave up their treasures and laid them at the foot of the altars. Neighbor abandoned neighbor, parents their offspring and brothers their sisters. If, says one of the chroniclers, in a circle of friends, any one only by a single word happened to bring the plague to mind. First one, and then another of the company was seized with a tormenting anguish. Certain that they were attacked with a mortal sickness, they slunk away home, and there soon yielded up the ghost. These fearful forms of pestilence were accompanied by moral epidemics more appalling than the physical. Of these, the two following may serve as an examples. Vast assemblages of men and women form circles hand in hand, dancing, leaping, shouting, insensible to external impressions. 
some seeing visions and spirits whose names they shrieked out, others in epileptic convulsions with foaming at the mouth, all continuing to make the most violent muscular exertions for hours together, until they fell to the ground in a state of exhaustion. Lookers-on were seized with an uncontrollable impulse to join in these wild revels. Peasants left their plows, mechanics their workshops, servants their masters, boys and girls their parents, women their domestic duties, and men their business, thus to spend days and nights, these infatuated crowds passing furiously through the streets, along highways, over fields, and from town to town. This madness pervaded the last barbarous countries of Europe for upwards of two centuries, under the name of the Dancing Mania. It was universally attributed to demoniacal possession, and its cure was attempted by exorcism. It was one expression and outlet of the violent passions of that time, imposture and profligacy playing principal parts in this strange drama. More pernicious than this madness was the mania of cruelty, an especial manifestation of which was the ferocious persecution of the Jews, who were put to death by hundreds and thousands under the accusation that they had poisoned the wells. At Basel, a number of this nation, whose European history proves them to have been everywhere amongst the most inoffensive of the people, were enclosed in a wooden building and burnt with it. At Strasbourg, two thousand were burnt alive. Whoever showed them compassion and endeavored to protect them were put upon the rack and burnt with them. In numerous instances, these unhappy people, driven to despair, assembled in their own habitations, to which they set fire and consumed themselves with their families. The noble and the mean bound themselves by an oath to extirpate them from the face of the earth by fire and sword. In England, this relentless cruelty took particularly the shape of burning innocent people under the name of witches, an infatuation which pervaded all classes from the highest to the lowest, affording a melancholy exemplification of the close alliance between credulity and cruelty. But in the midst of these terrible disorders, changes which had, which had been in silent operation during several centuries began to produce visible results. The independent power of the nobles had been suppressed. The feuds that raged between them, filling the country with disorder and bloodshed, had been put down. The supremacy of the law had been established. Property and life had become more secure. Industry had taken a surprising start. The practical abolition of serfdom had been to a large extent effected, and at last came the final breaking up of the feudal system in the reign of Henry the Seventh, by the passing of the law authorizing the alienation of land. About the middle of the fifteenth century, improvements in the condition of the people, which had been gradually affected by these changes, were accelerated by a succession of events that gave an extraordinary impulse to the human mind, just aroused from the long and deep sleep of the Middle Ages, that dark night which was now passing away. Among the most memorable of these was the invention of printing, which the three immortal masters of the art had now completed, giving untiring and undying wings to thought. The diffusion over the west of Europe of the remains of a former civilization by the dispersion of the treasures of classical art, literature, and science, which before Constantinople fell into the hands of barbarians, had been confined within the walls of that city. The cessation of the long and disastrous struggle between the East and the West by the expulsion of the Moors from Spain, the discovery of the New World, and lastly, the Reformation, that stupendous work which with giant strength burst asunder the chain which consummate skill and supreme power had spent ages in forging and riveting. That stupendous work, which was not merely emancipation from spiritual bondage, but the re-communication of the long-lost spirit of religion, the noble men who achieved it, being ever, even in their day of triumph, less intent on demolishing the gorgeous edifice that had held the mind enthralled, than on erecting a pure temple 
in which it might worship with sincerity and freedom. The last time when the foundation was laid for this intellectual and spiritual renovation was also that of the commencement of physical improvement. The towns being no longer fortresses, it became unnecessary to maintain their fortifications. Walls were thrown down, stagnant moats were filled up, broader streets were opened, more convenient houses were erected. Forests were cleared, marshes and swamps were drained. More land was brought under cultivation. More vegetable matter was produced. The art of collecting, storing, and preserving fodder was discovered. Fresh meat became the food of the people during a longer period of the year. In the course of two centuries, the length of that period had doubled, and at last such food was in use the whole winter. The products of growing art and manufacture superseded the beds of straw and displaced the floors of rushes. Famine ceased. There has been no recurrence of famine in England since the middle of the 15th century. 1448. The proportion of people in the enjoyment of moderate competence rapidly increased. It is computed that in the 16th century, the number of small freeholders realizing a clear income of between 60 pounds and 70 pounds a year amounted with their families to one-seventh of the whole population, and that the number of persons who tilled their own land was greater than the number of those who farmed the land of others. In the next century, the care of the public health became a recognized and direct object of the legislature and the magistracy. Better regulations were enforced in the metropolis for the removal of filth, for the construction and extension of sewers, and for widening, paving, and lighting the streets. In the middle of this century, the Great Fire of 1666 consumed 13,000 houses and left an open space of upwards of a square mile. This opportunity of improvement was not lost, though in rebuilding the city, the same lines of streets were preserved and the streets were still kept much too narrow, yet there was some improvement in the general plan, while the houses were built of better materials. Brick was substituted for wood and plaster, and the buildings were less crowded and less projecting. The spirit of improvement thus awakened exerted itself with increased effect during the whole of the 18th century. Agriculture, which was now rapidly advancing, had created a demand for town refuse the fertilizing property of which began to be perceived, so that all manner of offensive substances were regularly carried away to the fields, to the great increase of the cleanliness of the streets. At the same time, many of the narrower streets were widened. The houses were entirely taken down and rebuilt, and in this operation slate was universally substituted for thatch and brick for timber. The pavement also, which had long been the reproach of London, was improved. Population in the meantime rapidly increased, less by the relative increase of the number of births than by the proportionate decrease of the deaths. And this notwithstanding the occasional occurrence of severe pestilence, the result of the whole was an increase in the length of life. An increase in the length of life is an expression and a measure of the sum of comfort experienced from the whole collective circumstances that make up national prosperity. In the interval between the 17th and 18th centuries, that sum grew into a highly important one. Of this, the proof is positive. It happened that in the year 1693, a loan was raised for the service of the state by the method of Tontine, and that another was contracted by the same method in the year 1790, the interval being almost exactly a century. The term tontine is derived from the name of the originator of this scheme of life annuity, the principle of which is this. The person who advances a hundred pounds is at liberty to name any life he pleases, during the existence of which he draws a certain annuity. And as the shares of the dead nominees are distributed among the living ones, the annuity continually increases till the last survivor gets the whole income. A comparison of the experience between two tontines gives the exact measure of the effect produced on the duration of life by such changes in the social condition of the people 
as may have occurred in the interval between them. A person of the male sex, for there is a considerable difference in the results in the two sexes, living in 1793, compared with a male living in 1690, at 15 years of age, had gained an expectation of life of nearly 10 years, at 20 years of age, 9 years and a half, at 25 years of age, upwards of 8 years, at 30 years of age, upwards of 7 years, and so on. Or the gain in the expectation of life may be stated more correctly in years. Thus, take for example a man at the age of 30 in 1693, his expectation of life would have been 26.665. In 1790, it would have been 33.775 years. On this evidence, Mr. Finlayson justly observes that civilization could not have increased by a single leap in the time of Mr. Pitt, but must have been slowly on the increase at least since the days of Queen Anne. We may then fairly conclude that in the interval between the close of the 17th and 18th centuries, human life gained an addition equivalent to a fourth part of its whole term. What has it gained in the succeeding century? What has been the increase in the value of life in this first half of the century in which we ourselves have lived? Though unfortunately we can appeal to the results of no renewed tontine to enable us to answer this question with exactness, yet there are not wanting evidences that the value of life continues progressively to increase. It must necessarily continue to increase because the main conditions on which life and health depend have experienced during the whole of the present century, an expansion and improvement on which no former age presents a parallel. It will be sufficient to establish this fact. To glance at what has been effected within this period in the multiplication and diffusion of the three primary necessities of existence, food, clothing, and fuel. Such has been the increased production of food during the present century that the quantity now raised maintains 10 millions more human beings than existed at its commencement. For on the first enumeration of the people in 1801, the population of Great Britain was 11 millions. In 1851, it was 21 millions. This increased production of food consists chiefly of grain, green crops, and garden vegetables, countless in variety, and highly nutritious and grateful, completely reversing the nature of the national substance compared with that of former times, and giving to the masses of the people a constant and unfailing supply, winter and summer, of fresh vegetable nutriment. This increased production of food is mainly of home growth, for the supply of wheat from foreign sources would scarcely suffice to afford to each person two gallons of flour annually. This increased production has been obtained partly by a progressive increase in the quantity of land brought under cultivation, which now amounts for the United Kingdom to upwards of 40 million of acres, by far the greater part of which is employed in the production of human food, and partly by the employment of capital in the improvement of the soil by which large tracts that a few years ago were wholly sterile are deemed incapable of producing wheat now yield some of the finest grain in England. This increased fertility of the soil renders it more healthy by diminishing its moisture and raising its temperature. One cubic foot of water in the process of evaporation deprives three millions of cubic feet of air of one degree of temperature. An undrained field growing rushes has a permanent temperature from four to six degrees lower than an adjoining field drained and growing wheat. By draining and manuring, by throwing down fences, by removing trees, by clearing underwood, and by promoting the free aeration of the soil, the temperature of large tracts of land in the north of England has been permanently raised three degrees. Thus, the very culture of the earth by which it is made to yield the largest amount of food increases its salubrity as an abode for man, and lessens at their source the main causes of epidemics. 
this increased production has been obtained by a proportionately small addition to labor. For while the quantity of land brought under cultivation and its produce have been increasing at a rate of which there is no similar example in any Asia country, the relative number of persons employed in agriculture has been as steadily decreasing. As long as the labor of a man applied to the cultivation of the soil is capable of producing only a bare substances for himself, there can be no advance in civilization. But when two men can produce subsistence for three, the labor of the third can be set free for the production of surplus articles, which add to the sum of the general convenience, and from that moment the community takes a start in the career of improvement. From a comparison of occupations taken in 1831, it appears that, at that time, the division of labor among the people was such that one person raised nearly all the food of home production consumed by four persons. Were the remaining three idle? Immediately or immediately, they were engaged in producing clothing or fuel or machinery, economizing the production of both, and busily and well they worked. In number, they exceed one million and a half. Taking into account the accessory occupations, indeed, no fewer than one million two hundred thousand are employed on one single material alone, namely cotton. For these workers, at the beginning of the century, there were imported yearly fifty-six millions of pounds of cotton. At present, the annual importation of it exceeds five hundred and fifty millions of pounds. These workers, in 1820, were assisted in their operations by 14,000 power looms. At present, they are assisted by 300,000 power looms, besides 25 millions of spindles, while each power loom, superintended by an adult assisted by a child, completes weekly 20 times the amount of work which the hand loom is capable of producing. The increase of production is, of course, enormous and the effect is a progressive cheapening of the articles manufactured, reducing the price of some of them tenfold, and placing them within the reach of the poorest classes. Articles of clothing not only conducive to health through warmth, but also equally so through cleanliness, for they are all almost composed of such tissues and textures as favor and compel frequent washing. Gigantic strides have been made at the same time in another article of clothing, the basis of which is wool, and of which there were imported in 1801 seven millions of pounds, in 1844 sixty-three millions of pounds. This enormous importation of foreign wool has not only diminished its home growth, but the increased demand for it has led to a vast multiplication of the animals that yield it, and what is of equal importance has induced an extraordinary care in improving their breed, so that the very means which have fed the steam engine have fed the people both with more plentiful and with better food. The steam engine, meanwhile, applied to these and to all manufacturing processes, being as much a producer of food as the plow. And the same is emphatically true of fuel. The main creator of all this activity and of its astonishing results. This necessary of life being now brought to the door of every family in threefold abundance and at one half the price of which it could have been obtained at the commencement of the century. While such is the demand for it in various manufactures of vast magnitude, that one trade alone, that of iron, consumes annually eight millions of tons a trade which immediately and powerfully facilitates the production both of food and of clothing. Thus, like one of nature's beautiful adaptations, like that wonderful cycle, for example, in which production, change, and reproduction go on in an unvarying circle, the constant and abundant supply of one main necessary of life furnishes the means of producing the others, while these last are the immediate causes of the abundance of the first. And what a busy hive does this country present at the present time? Out of every thousand males twenty years of age in the kingdom, 
836 are directly employed in some active occupation contributing to the national wealth, while the remaining 114 are by no means idle, for they are engaged in some one of the professions. Though the masses have not yet obtained their due share of the wealth they create, and though there is a class which in relation to one essential condition to be stated immediately, civilization has scarcely reached or reached only to injure, with these expectations no doubt very important ones, the evidence is indubitable that the entire body of society, from its base to its apex, stands on an elevated tableland, which many centuries have been employed in raising and consolidating. I have partly proved this by showing the general diffusion of the means of healthful subsistence and the prolongation of life. I am now to prove it by applying these facts to the subject more especially before us, the decline and disappearance of epidemics. It is now exactly two centuries short of ten years since the visitation of the Great Plague of 1665, that terrible disease which ravaged England for the space of 1,249 years, for it is first heard of in English history in the year 430, and the last year in which its name appears in the Bills of Mortality is 1679. That terrible disease, which not only maintained undiminished power over this vast space of time, but which sometimes recurred twenty times in one century, that terrible disease is gone. It cannot be supposed that it has worn itself out, for it still frequently returns with its ancient malignity to Constantinople, Alexandria, Smyrna, and other eastern states. Pedicyle, or jail fever, the fatal scourge of the ship, the prison, the hospital, the school, and in short of every place in which any considerable number of persons was assembled, and which once it broke out, was as destructive as a plague, that terrible disease is gone. Intermittent fever, which in the middle of the fifteenth century, and long afterwards, recurred like the plague periodically, but more frequently, and which often raged as universally, which was sometimes so mortal that the living could hardly bury the dead, and which spared not even the throne, for James I and Oliver Cromwell both died of plague contracted in London. That formidable disease is gone. Plague, it is true, still exists in the finny and marsh places which yet remain in England. And we occasionally see a case contracted there in the wards of the London Fever Hospital, but I have not seen a single case of plague contracted in London for upwards of a quarter of a century. Remittent fever is also gone, scurvy is gone, rickets is gone, malignant sore throat is gone, typhus gravier is gone, and if smallpox is not gone, it is entirely the consequence of our own apathy and folly. No less remarkable is the gradual decline and the ultimate cessation of certain forms of bowel compliant of a very painful nature the very names of which have been long disappeared both from medical and popular language. In the seventeenth century, the deaths from two of these diseases alone registered in the bills of mortality under two separate titles were never less than one thousand annually, and in some years they exceeded four thousand. But from having been one thousand seventy in the year seventeen hundred, they decreased through each successive decade of that century in the following remarkable progression. 770, 706, 350, 150, 110, 80, 70, 40, 20. And they have so entirely disappeared during the 19th century that, as I have just said, their very names are no longer in use. Moreover, several acute diseases which hardly come under the name of epidemics, such as rheumatic fever, pneumonia, and pneumonia are much less frequent and fatal now than they were a century ago. All this time there has been a continuously decreasing mortality. In 1700 the estimated mortality of England and Wales was 1 in 39. In 1750 it was 1 in 40. In 1801 it was 1 in 44. In 1810 it was 1 in 49. 
In 1820, it was 1 in 55. And in 1830, it was 1 in 58. In London, in 1700, the deaths were 1 in 25. In 1750, 1 in 21. In 1801, 1 in 35. In 1810, 1 in 38. And in 1830, 1 in 45. The diminishing number of those who are born merely to die exhibits the decrease of mortality in a still more striking point of view. The estimated mortality of persons under 20 years of age in London in 1780 was 1 in 76. In 1801, it was 1 in 96. In 1830, it was 1 in 124. In 1833, it was 1 in 137. Not much more than one half the proportion who died under twenty half a century ago. The contrast between the mortality of former times and of the present is seen in the mortality of London in 1685 and in 1830. In the first period, the deaths were one in 23. In the second, they were one in 45, little more than one half. Truly, therefore, has it been said, that the salubrity of London in the 19th century and of London in the 17th is far greater than the difference between London in an ordinary season and London in the cholera. But still we have had cholera. In less than a quarter of a century, we have had three visitations of this dreadful disease, which exhibits the essential characters of a pestilence of the Middle Ages. And if typhus gravior has disappeared, Typhus and its kindred diseases have taken its place, and the Registrar General constantly presents before our eyes a faithful record of their ravages. This is too true. We still have epidemics, and why? Because in all our towns there are large portions of the people who live in a state essentially the same as that which existed in the Middle Ages. The conditions are similar, the results are similar, It is this unhappy class of people that form the exception to the general progress of the nation to which I have adverted. These wretched places and their inhabitants do not obtrude themselves on the public eye. They are not seen in our common thoroughfares, nor in our splendid streets and squares. They are not known. The medical man knows them. The minister of religion knows them. The relieving officer knows them. A few dispensers of voluntary charity know them. They are not known to anyone else. Let me then describe one. It is a small room, say 12 feet square, an inner room, no chimney, no window that will open, no inlet for fresh air, no outlet for foul air. There, on a miserable bed, lies a woman ill of typhus fever, a child at her side on the same bed is dying of that fever. A child already dead of it is stretched out on a table at the bedside. I could not breathe the air of that room. I could not remain in it long enough to write a prescription for the poor patients. As I was writing it at the street door, I shivered and felt sick. I knew that I had taken fever. I passed through a very severe form of it. I could take you to hundreds of such houses in every part of London to hundreds of courts and lanes wholly consisting of such houses. In such houses, with the conditions of the 15th and 16th centuries, cholera, in the middle of the 19th, found and exerted a power similar to that which characterized the epidemics of the Middle Ages. And here, typhus and its kindred diseases continually hold their undisputed reign. Houses whose unhealthfulness is increased by the only marks of the age which attach to them, their brick construction and their glass windows. Those bricks and windows more effectually than the ancient wattles excluding the external and confining the internal air, and thereby fostering the generation and spread of typhus. It is remarked by Dr. Malacott in his account of the Herbrides that while the inhabitants had no shelter, but huts of the most simple construction, which afforded free ingress and egress to the air, they were not subject to fevers. But, when such habitations were provided as seemed more comfortable and commodious, but which afforded recesses for stagnating air and impurities, 
then febrile infection was generated. Houses in this state, without ventilation, without the men means of cleanliness, worse than the huts of the savage, exist in great numbers in all our towns, and two truly merit the name that they have acquired of fever nests. I once took a distinguished statistician of France to some of these places in London and showed him the sick with typhus lying in their wretched beds, for the sick with typhus may be seen there every day of every year. After the painful inspection, he exclaimed, England is indeed adorned with a splendid mantle, but under it are concealed the greatest horrors. Determined that this eminent person should see both sides of the picture, I next took him to the model dwellings. What are the model dwellings? Small plots of civilization cultivated in the midst of a wide waste of barbarism. In what does their civilization consist? In very simple matters. The subsoil drainage of the site of the building the free admission of light and air to each inhabited room, the abolition of the cesspool involving complete house drainage, an abundant supply of water, and the immediate removal by it of all refuse which it is capable of holding in suspension, means for the removal of house refuse not capable of suspension in water. And this is all. And what are the results of these few and simple arrangements? that the mortality among the inhabitants of these dwellings is less than that of gen London generally, and far less than that of some of the filthy and neglected localities in London. The potteries of Kensington, for example, while the mortality among children under ten years of age, on an average of three years, is one-half less than that of the nation generally, and four times less than that of the potteries that there has not been a single death from typhus or any other form of continued fever among the adults in any of these buildings since their establishment, and that during the first two visitations of epidemic cholera, with the exception of two cases which occurred under peculiar circumstances, there was no attack of cholera in any of these buildings, while from four to six deaths from the pestilence occurred in single houses in the immediate neighborhood. Such are the results of the first imperfect attempt at improvement, which, remarkable as they are, are not more striking than the results of neglect. Of the children born in the best part of a town, one-fifth die before they attain the fifth year of age. Of the children born in the worst, one-half die before they attain their fifth year. The inhabitants of the worst localities attain little more than one-half of the age of those who live in the best. Of 100,000 children born in Surrey, 7,423 attain the age of 10 years, 52,000 live to the age of 50, and 28,878 live to 70. In Liverpool, out of 100,000 persons born, only 48,211 live 10 years, 25,878 live 50 years and 8,373 live 70 years. The probable duration of life in Surrey is 53 years. In Liverpool, it is 26 years. Were the whole of the metropolis as healthy as the model dwellings, there would be an annual saving in London of nearly 20,000 lives. But these lives are not saved. This number of persons is allowed to perish every year, and they are as truly and as needlessly sacrificed as if they were taken out on Bethnal Green and shot. When we bear in mind the suffering which in every case accompanies this waste of life, and the suffering which must inevitably follow it, and remember that it is admitted that these dreadful evils are remediable and preventable, it is difficult to suppress the natural feelings of indignation and of sorrow, that in a country calling itself Christian, the application of the known remedies should be so long delayed. It is right, however, to acknowledge that something has been done, and is in progress, for the improvement of the sanitary condition of the people. The principle is admitted that it is the duty of the legislature to deal with this matter, and the first systematic legislative effort to bring about a better state of things has been made. The Public Health Act is in operation, and the general and proper application by local authorities of the powers it confers 
would place every part of every town in Great Britain in as good a sanitary condition, at least, as that of the model dwellings. Up to the present time, 1855, there are under this act 196 towns containing a population of upwards of two and a quarter millions. In about 50 of these towns, however, nothing has yet been done. Eleven towns with a population of about half a million have adopted the powers of the act in subsequent local acts. Works of drainage and water supply are completed, or are in an advanced state in 70 towns. Mortgages have been sanctioned. For drainage works and water supply, nearly one three-quarter million sterling. For private works of drainage and water supply, about 45,000 pounds. For paving street and improvements, etc., about 200,000 pounds, making a total of nearly two millions sterling devoted to sanitary improvement. It is difficult at present to give the average cost of these combined and complete sanitary works, but the total expense for public and private works of drainage and water supply for houses of from 10 pounds to 20 pounds per annual rental may be taken at four per week per house. The great obstacle to sanitary progress is the fear of rates, not so much on the part of the poor, who gladly pay for the improvements, but on the part of the owners of small tenements, by whom chiefly opposition is raised to the application of this act. In the town of Alnwick, public and private works of sewerage and drainage have been completed. There have been laid down about 20 miles of sewers and drains, and 17 miles of apparatus for water supply, at a total cost for the combined works of four per week per house for the term of 30 years, after the expiration of which the period cost of the works, both principal and interest, will have been liquidated, and the only expense thereafter will be for maintenance. On inspecting these works, I saw in the tenements occupied by the lowest classes a high degree of cleanliness, wholesomeness, and comfort, and heard from the inhabitants an expression of the greatest satisfaction. We have as yet no certain knowledge of the extent to which such works are capable of preventing sickness and lengthening life, but the most perfect drainage combined with the most ample supply of water will not alone secure for the public health all which it is practicable to accomplish. There must also be provision for the better construction of the houses of the poor, for the prevention of overcrowding, for street ventilation and cleansing, and for the exclusion from the neighborhood of human dwellings of filth-creating animals and of noxious trades. When all this is done, as it might be done, and as it would be done, were there a general perception of the crying evils it would remedy, epidemics would disappear, the more formidable of them immediately, and all of them, I believe, in the end. From the whole of these facts and observations we see, one, that epidemics are under our own control. We may promote their spread, we may prevent it. We may secure ourselves from them. We have done so. We have banished the most formidable. Those that remain are not so difficult to be conquered as those that have been vanquished. The causes of typhus are more completely under our control than those of intermittent. We have banished intermittent. We may put an end to typhus. We have actually done so. We have encompassed the model dwellings by a barrier which neither typhus, nor even cholera, nor any of the other causes of excessive sickness and premature mortality have been able to pass. To the residents within that barrier, the chance of life has almost been doubled. To their children, it has been doubled, and compared with some other children of their own class, it has been increased fourfold. 2. We see that epidemics are not made by a divine law, the necessary condition of man's existence upon earth. The boon of life is not marred with this penalty. The great laws of nature, which are God's ordinances, and their regular course and appointed operation, do not form off and give off around us products which are injurious to us, but he has given us senses to perceive them, and reason to devise the means of avoiding them, and epidemics arise and spread because we will not regard the one nor use the other. 3. 
we see that there are circumstances which render it doubtful whether civilization has yet attained a point that places it beyond the danger of retrogression. States in some respects of higher civilization than our own have relapsed into barbarism. There is indeed one circumstance which may give us hope. There is one humanizing principle which is now at least recognized an impartial operation of which there is no trace in any nation of antiquity. I mean the principle of kindness as a governing influence, distinguished from the principle of brute force. That the whole human race is one family, that the people of every color, clime, language, government, and faith are one brotherhood, and that the same law of love, which is the bond of the union, strength, and happiness of a single family, is equally binding on the universal family of mankind are the fundamental and distinguishing principles of our religion, and in proportion to our conformity and our private and public life to spirit of those divine principles, advancement in civilization is certain, relapse into barbarism is impossible. But as yet, there is no such conformity. We neglect the education of the people, quarreling about the mode and postponing the thing. We devote to a life of absorbing labor the child and the youth ungrounded in the elements of knowledge, untrained to habits of self-restraint, thereby dooming the man to the blankness and turbulence of ignorance and intemperance. We equally neglect the sanitary condition of the people. We make no provision for securing to the humblest classes, and they can make none for themselves. The conditions that are essential to their physical health, the loss of which to them involves and includes every other, we thus neglect body and mind, and then the disorders and vices which necessarily follow we endeavor to repress by punishments that harden but never reform, neither trusting nor trying the influence of gentleness, which our religion teaches us is stronger than ignorance, stronger than crime, and can master both. It is this state of things that places in danger the arc of civilization. Lastly, we see the first step that must be taken to elevate the people, nay, even to bring them within the pale of the civilization already attained. We must improve their sanitary condition. Until this is done, no civilizing influence can touch them. The schoolmaster will labor in vain. The minister of religion will labor in vain. Neither can make any progress in the fulfillment of their mission in a den of filth. Moral purity is incompatible with bodily impurity. Moral degradation is indissolubly and united with physical squalor. The depression and discomfort of the hovel produce and foster obtuseness of mind, hardness of heart, selfish and sensual indulgence, violence and crime. It is the home that makes the man. It is the home that educates the family. It is the distinction and the curse of barbarism that it is without a home. It is this distinction and the blessing of civilization that it prepares a home in which Christianity may abide and guide and govern.